Hello and welcome. I'm Anya Graney Elrod. I'm the Communications Coordinator here at the Centre for Celiac Research and Treatment at Mass General for Children. Today I'm here with Cleo Davidowitz, the Clinical Research Coordinator at our Centre. Welcome, Cleo. Thank you for having me, Anya. Oh, well, it's great that you took time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Um, now, Cleo, I was reading, I think it was last year, I was reading a study, which actually, if I recall, was a fairly local, as in here in the Boston area study, that people who study celiac disease and who, who make that their area of, uh, you know, scientific emphasis, uh, at about 42%, I read, um, either have lived experience of celiac disease or a family connection with celiac disease. And that certainly applies to you, correct? Yes, it does. I actually have celiac disease myself. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old. Oh. And yeah, I've been living with it ever since and kind of got into celiac disease research uh, when I started working here at, at MGH. Right. So you're kind of the face here behind the statistic, right? Um, in fact, a number, a number of our colleagues have lived experience with celiac disease. So going back to your, you know, your childhood, well, we'll start with where you grew up. And then if you want to talk a bit about your kind of diagnostic journey. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in New York City. Um, I lived with my mom, my dad, and my two younger siblings. And I'd always been a really slow grower, um, underweight, just very small. But between my nine and 10th birthday, I didn't grow at all, which is obviously very abnormal for a child. So my pediatrician ran a bunch of blood tests and celiac disease ones came back positive. Um, he actually called my mom on Thanksgiving to, to tell her because she hadn't answered her messages. Um, and they set up an appointment with a gastroenterologist and also scheduled my endoscopy. And so I uh, underwent the endoscopy and the biopsies came back as showing damage. So I, and they could also actually see it uh, during the endoscopy on, on the screen. So sometimes, you know, the damage isn't necessarily visible and it's more at the cellular level, but they were actually able to see the damage. So they knew that um, it was a pretty severe case of celiac disease. Wow. And I know that there are many symptoms, but in your case, it was, it was the lack of growth or the stalling <laughs> of your growth. Exactly. Yeah. So. Clinically, they also call it failure to thrive when you're not growing and also not gaining weight. But I actually had zero GI symptoms. So uh, mm. other than that, there were there were no signs. Okay, great. So here you are, 10 years old, and, uh, you know, you were in about third grade, fourth grade? In fourth grade, yeah. Fourth grade, okay. And so how did school and home change for you after your diagnosis? Yeah, so I have to say I had an amazing clinical team, um, great gastroenterologist. Obviously, my pediatrician was super informed as well. And after my diagnosis, I got set up with a nutritionist appointment and was kind of educated on the gluten-free diet um, with my family. And because no one else in my family has celiac disease, you know, I had my own things. My mom would prepare separate meals for me, and then my rest of the rest of my family would eat gluten. And it was a pretty seamless transition, honestly, because I didn't really like bread or sandwiches uh, at that age. So it was it was easy to cut out some of the most common foods. I think other things were a little trickier where, you know, we didn't know that soy sauce had gluten in it or even mm -hmm. Twizzlers. I think I was eating Twizzlers um, and we found out they had gluten in it. And obviously I, I wouldn't get symptoms, so I didn't know when I was eating gluten or not. So it was a bit of a trial and an error, but um, you know, I was lucky that I could bring my own snacks to school and that the cafeteria at my school could provide gluten-free meals for me as well. And was that also true for when you went on to high school? Yeah, so that was in elementary school and then middle school, um, I was continuing bringing my own snacks and my school would provide lunch. Um, and I did actually get glutened by my school twice, uh, which was unfortunate. So I, I ended up developing symptoms about two years after my diagnosis, um, GI symptoms. So that was kind of unusual to adjust to never having had any GI symptoms whatsoever to suddenly even a little bit of gluten made me react. Um, so that was one adjustment. And when I got to high school, I would bring my lunch every day. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that, you know, it was very easy for me to have food at school. Most people brought their lunch anyways, because the cafeteria food was not the most delicious or appetizing. Uh, so I didn't really feel other compared to my peers, because we were all bringing in our own lunches anyways. So not the big kind of social adjustments or sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, sense of being different or isolated. Um, great. And then um, college, away from home, away from mom's prepared meals. Um, <laughs> was that was that a big... Well, where did you go to college, Cleo? So I went to Middlebury College in Vermont. It's a small liberal arts college. And they actually have three dining halls there. Um, and I was very lucky. They had amazing gluten-free options. They had, you know, a separate toaster um, and section for like cereal and gluten-free bread and, and peanut butter. And uh, it was kind of a buffet style line. So they had the ingredients of everything listed. And in one of the dining halls, if I couldn't eat, you know, one of the main dishes, they would actually prepare it for me wow. separately. Um, so I think one time they made me like some fried chicken dish uh, in, a, in a separate clean fryer, which was amazing of them to do. So I felt very lucky. I think I only got sick once because the peanut butter at the gluten-free section had obviously been contaminated. Mm -hmm. um, so after that, they started putting the peanut butter in a separate cabinet. So I think the, the only challenge or kind of extra step I would have to take would be to ask the kitchen staff for a key to unlock the toaster or unlock the panini press or get the peanut butter. So, um, it, you know, it was a little bit harder compared to my peers in terms of accessing those things, but it had to be done for everyone's safety. So I understood why they had to keep it under lock and key right, right. Uh, so that we could avoid contamination. Right. Right. Okay, and now here you are uh, in the Boston area, uh, out and working and, and in the field that's close to your passions, your interests. Um, talk a little bit about how, I know that you've translated some of those experiences with navigating the gluten-free diet, which of course, as we know, is the only current treatment for celiac disease. And sort of how I know that you've used that on you know to to self advocate and also advocate for others and and sort of offering some guidelines about how to adjust to the diet. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing in that area, in your kind of extracurricular life, if you will? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I've always loved taking pictures of food, loved baking, cooking. And I think especially when you have a dietary restriction, it makes you value the meals that you do really enjoy. And, that, you know, I'm always so excited when I find a gluten-free version of something that I've, I've never been able to try. So I started about a little more than a year ago on Instagram called Celiac Cleo. And if you don't know, Instagram is a photo-based platform where you can post photos and stories and interact with other, other people online. So I started this just to kind of document, put a, have a place to document my meals and all the gluten-free restaurants or options that I've been trying in Boston. And it kind of, it's, it's been growing and I've really enjoyed um, sharing these photos. I also like sharing different recipes I make um, or different products I find grocery shopping and interacting with other creators because there is a pretty big online community mm -hmm. of people with celiac disease or just people who are gluten-free and have other dietary restrictions. Um, and I've also been really lucky to work with um, Katerina, our dietitian at the Celiac Disease Center, uh, in creating a video on ways to eat out safely when you have celiac disease. Um, so I'm very excited to continue uh, creating these resources and, and patient advocacy. We also recently created a new list of gluten-free restaurants in Boston to give out to our patients at the center. Uh, so all of these things have been really fun for me because, you know, I'm already doing the research for myself. So right. I, I just love sharing it with other people as well. And you've lived through it. I mean, you're living through it every day, every meal, every every day. That's wonderful that you're so open to sharing it. Well, I just want to thank you, Cleo, for joining us today. I know I learned a lot and that's because of you and your willingness to share your own personal experience and also your work in advocacy. Um, some of these resources that Cleo mentioned, including the restaurant list and also that, that um, research about the link between 
lived experience in celiac disease and your areas of specialization. I will put those at the end of this video. So I want to thank you out there also for watching and for joining us today. So thank you again, Cleo. Thank you for having me.